day. Good day. Yeah, I think it's on. Yeah. Should be on. Good day. We are I'm sweating. Beginning the next uh, I'm session. Sweating. And uh, first <laughs> speaking, speaker <laughs> it is uh, <laughs> Professor Srinivasan. Please. Okay, thank you. Just uh, shake hands with our director. Hi. <laughs> so I'm here. Thanks for coming. Okay. So, thank you, sir, for the introduction. You want to say something? Um, I want to talk about um, this topic. Uh, it's supposedly on, but uh, it's fallen off, that's all. <laughs> um, Snezana su uh, suggested that I speak about this topic, and I think after a while she got a little nervous as to whether I would in fact live up to her expectations. But then she was committed to me already, so it would be impossible to change it. Um, so. What I want to talk about is the program um, that has survived or existed for 10 years. And uh, 10 years, as you know, is a long time. It's a long time because uh, many of us who have been coming to this program have changed jobs. Some of them, some of us, that is, um, have uh, changed fields and some probably even uh, uh, their spouses, uh, whatever, but it's been a long, it is a long time. And uh, it's uh, also, it also happens that some of the colleagues who were associated with this program have disappeared. Um, there is Steve Arsag, uh, Padma Shukla, and Norbert Peters, then uh, Oleg uh, here, and then uh, Leo Kadnoff. All of them were associated or came to this program at one time or another, but they have uh, left us and gone somewhere. So it's a long time in some sense. So it's a good, good time to ask questions like, um, what's been accomplished by this program in the last 10 years? I think it's a reasonable question to ask. And um, beyond that, beyond uh, the people who come to this meeting, um, what's been accomplished by the larger scientific community, which uh, uh, professes to work on this subject, that is turbulent mixing and beyond. And uh, what may lie ahead for the subject and for the program itself, I must uh, right away confess that it is foolhardy to talk about such things. Um, therefore, I start with an apology to uh, all of you in some way. At least to some degree, these comments that I'll make reflect my prejudices, my shortcomings, and I'm sure I'll offend all of you in one form or another. Uh, so you have to bear with me, and uh, we'll uh, move on with that understanding. Um, but first, I should uh, maybe remind ourselves to get us on the same page as to what the past activities of the program were and what its goals were. So first of all, how did the program come into being? Um, in 2005, Snezana made a proposal for the TMB program to be held at ICTP in 2007. Usually it takes about a year, a year and a half. And uh, at that time, her thinking was something like this. You heard these words from her before. Turbulent mixing takes many forms, steady and unsteady, single phase, multi-phase, subsonic, supersonic, and hypersonic speeds at very small scales and very large scales. 
And because uh, the subject is rather diverse, the communities that work in these topics are very diverse as well. Some work on very basic problems and some work on very applied contexts. And they have traditionally worked somewhat disjointly. They have not really talked to each other all that much. And so part of the goal for this meeting was to bring these communities together on the belief that they could benefit from each other. In fact, yesterday I was talking to Bruce Remington, and he says he comes to these meetings mainly because um, in no other meeting does he meet people whom he does normally not meet at all. So it probably not just him, but many others could make the same statement. And the goal of the program was to bring together these communities, uh, working on turbulent mixing and beyond. The and beyond part is quite important, uh, because not every talk here is about turbulent mixing, clearly. Anything that has some connection to mixing, if you simply put up a first slide saying you work on mixing and then do whatever you want to say, it still somehow works in this case. It, the only I thought is it must be interesting and connected in some uh, spiritual way to the subject. And uh, to accomplish the goals that I set forth uh, here, um, it, this came about just about a year or so um, after the meeting was actually proposed. Um, so the first thing is, I embrace mixing in all its richness. That is, don't simply say, I'm going to be interested only in passive scalar mixing in isotropic and homogeneous turbulence, um, and um, uh, meet regularly and raise money for it, of course. Um, and uh, the scientific program, these were the goals. Um, through the understanding that simple problems, um, one increases one's intuition that will be applicable to very complex problems. You can't simply say, well, I'm interested in very complex problems. Let me just not worry about the basic stuff you do. Likewise, it was very important to, be, uh, to have a predictive capability for complex problems. And, uh, of course, the idea was to publish things in some comprehensive way, in cohesive venues, and strengthen links between experiments, simulations, and theories, between applications and basic work, and build community expertise via educational and outreach programs, um, and organize mechanisms to share research tools, data analysis and visualization, and finally, this was spelled out explicitly, prepare a white paper for the community project for the US National Academies uh, to launch a decade of study of non-equilibrium turbulent process. So that was a very specific goal. So when I make an assessment of whether the program is successful or not, it's against these goals that I will try to make an assessment. Otherwise, you can go all over the map in, uh, in uh, making statements. So the first meeting was held in 2007, and here is a group photograph that uh, uh, was taken at the time. And I want to point out, you will probably find some of uh, your own pictures. I'll only point out to some important people, um, if I can. There is Snedana here. There is Joe sitting here. And there is Victor Loa, from whom I got this picture. And there is Susie, uh, who really ran the program at the time. That's the uh, important people here. The rest of them uh, don't matter. Um, so if you can't actually recognize yourselves, here is a list, a full list of uh, uh, people who are present. So it was a huge list, and I'll pause for a second to see if you can actually find out um, where your name is. And not very long. Um, then it was pretty successful in terms of number of people and the quality of people that came. The second one, even more so, because it didn't last for one week, actually. It lasted for almost two weeks. And there were 80 are the invited speakers. And here is the full list, but I'm not going to let you read it. Um, that's two years after the first one. And two years later, there was another one. 
And at this point, we had already realized that one of the things we should do better is trying to uh, um, induct younger people into the program because usually it's uh, okay, we get uh, uh, accomplished people, let's say. And uh, then uh, that's not enough, so younger people are essential. So we said, uh, well, we should have some tutorials, um, et cetera, for the younger people. That was done. And there was a list um, again. So it was uh, uh, pretty clear uh, from all this that uh, uh, many uh, uh, people of distinction came to these meetings and they made contributions, uh, which I will tell you later on. And also, uh, different people participated in different ways. Some partied, like Joe Nimla there. Others were very busy um, uh, listening to lectures. Maybe you will recognize some of yourselves there. Again, uh, lots of people. And uh, here is another set. Um, here is uh, another set, and uh, all people uh, having dinner, and some people uh, dancing to music uh, that was being provided uh, here by Joe. And some were dancing even without music. You can actually see this here. So that was a very uh, interesting and lively set of meetings. And on top of it, um, uh, besides the, uh, the support that ICTP gave, Snezana in particular was able to raise money from all these agencies, uh, some from uh, the US, some from Europe, some from um, all parts of the world, France, Japan, Russia, um, all, all UK, all these places. Although I must say that it may look very successful at this point that it was uh, the program was able to raise a lot of money, but in reality, it was a bit hard. Um, it was like uh, pulling teeth out of, out of a patient. You know, you accumulate some money from each of these people, so it uh, ultimately boils down to something significant. I don't know why it should be that we can't support science better, but that's the way it was. Nevertheless, the program always had enough money to support its uh, participants. And at that point, um, I got a little worried because we had so many programs, as three programs already run by the time, so many participants. Um, we could always say every meeting had about 150 to 200 people. But in any given lecture, there were only about uh, 40 people or 50 people. Um, some were going to uh, Basilicus to see all this stuff, um, like Itamar, uh, for instance. But some were simply not here because they didn't see anything interesting that, uh, that was happening in the rest of the sessions. So it was not like a regular conference. It was like many conferences put together in one. So we thought we could take a break. And Snezana instead organized, with some uh, help from me, um, a meeting in the plasma physics meeting of the American Physical Society in Denver, in lieu of the program in 2013, we just wanted to think a little bit as to what might be happening or what should be happening. And that meeting was very successful. There were many invited talks and, and tutorials and so on. I hear list uh, the participants. So um, at that point, we thought that meeting here in ICTP was very valuable. And uh, the concern we had, that is, a lot of people with very disparate interests were coming to this meeting. It wasn't clear that we were actually succeeding in putting them all together. And uh, so we thought a meeting more focused would be better. And that's what happened the subsequent year, 2014. And uh, this one was the fourth meeting. And deliberately, the focus was limited to um, uh, limited to uh, mixing in rapidly changing environment, uh, particularly in inertial confinement and things like that. And as a consequence, there was a significant participation from the US national labs, and it was very 
interesting meeting where we learned uh, significantly about the kind of problems that um, uh, people in ICF have. And of course, this meeting, you know, uh, it's the numbers that Snezana provided. A uh, lot of uh, people, thank you all for coming here. Uh, but I know uh, there could be more people at this uh, uh, meeting, for instance. And uh, then, in terms of visibility, um, well, uh, I googled uh, turbulence, um, uh, turbulent mixing and beyond. I didn't say how many thousands because I got different numbers uh, depending on whether I googled here or in New York City. Uh, so, but I'm sure you will google them as we keep talking about it. Um, and of course, there were many publications that resulted, 250 publications, believe it or not. And uh, they were all uh, different topics, like the one I have listed here. And many of them appeared in Physica Scripta in these issues, to which many of you actually contributed. And again, uh, thank you very much for that. So that was a very significant number. And the uh, authors, who, the editors of those issues, I have uh, listed here. On top of it, there were other uh, issues of the proceedings of the uh, transactions of the Royal Society, and also uh, people who edited that are uh, listed here. So uh, everybody, in some sense or the other, has contributed to the uh, visibility of the program. But I must ask, um, now to, be, uh, to be a little bit rigorous, how much of this work is new? I mean, in other words, uh, things that were going on already uh, sort of gets going anyhow. Uh, is that the case, or is it something uh, different? And did this program uh, generate new collaborations that otherwise would not have happened? I think this is a very reasonable question to ask. Um, and I will uh, uh, tell you a little bit about how I came to these numbers. Of course, I haven't read all the papers, I must confess. Uh, some of you may have read all of them. Um, but I did look at which one was original, which one seemed like a lot of review, and things like that. So a lot of the work actually is new. And uh, the new collaborations that you would uh, never have thought possible, a few of them have appeared uh, since the time the program came into being, but not too many. Uh, people who write together are already people who are collaborating with themselves. And so that was uh, a significant part. There were a, new, a few new collaborations um, that I am aware of myself. And then all of this is fine in terms of um, what went on logistically and so on. But like Itamar would ask, uh, what are the results? What are the results of this whole thing, right? It's a lot of activity, a lot of papers, a lot of uh, things. So that's what I would like to spend the rest of the time on. Um, but I must also say, again, I could go off in many different directions. And so I take as guidance the focus of the, the, the results of the roundtable discussion, which said these must be our goals. Our goals must be, uh, there were, um, believe it or not, a real consensus that there were many experimental facilities, new ones that are required in order to study certain problems. Well, has that happened or not? Uh, new measurement techniques had to be invented. Have they happened or not? It may not be necessarily by the people who are here. I'm just taking a bigger view of the community that is interested in turbulent mixing and related problems. And I'm asking whether, in fact, these things have happened since then in the last decade. Advanced simulations had to be used in synergy with experiments and theories. We have to aim for basic results, some of the ones. You can't simply, um, uh, you, you have to come to some conclusion about some problems. Uh, that's what I mean by specific. And applied research and basic results have to be tied together better. Uh, this, this is the standard by which I will try to ask myself. And I will uh, say what in the last 10 years has happened in these uh, topics. But of course, the choice of my topics is entirely my own, and, and so you should uh, uh, excuse me for that, as I already said. In terms of facilities, uh, Eberhard built a fantastic facility in Gottingen, um, a closed-circuit wind tunnel like this. 
uh, using sulfur hexafluoride as the working fluid, and it can be pressurized from 1 millibar to 15 bar, so that's a huge change in pressure. As a result, the density changes, and the Reynolds number can change over several orders of magnitude, and uh, using traditional grid, he could get up to Reynolds number of 1500, microscale Reynolds number, and if he used active grid, it would be about 7,500. This is about 1.5 times more than what was already done some time ago by Kistler and Rebolovich in 1966. And there was a wind tunnel in the University in California, Southern California, that the aircraft companies used to use for testing model, testing full-scale aircraft. And before it was decommissioned. Uh, they were asked to do some basic study in that uh, wind tunnel for some time. And uh, that Reynolds number went up to about 1,000 or thereabouts. Now, uh, this tunnel is working, but you might ask what are the results, um, as always. And one result that actually came about is um, that, in fact, you see behind the grid the energy of uh, turbulence decaying like a power law. And the power law exponent in the past has sort of, which did not cover very high Reynolds numbers, so it covered maybe up to here. You can see uh, pretty much uh, any exponent you can find. But what this experiment in particular, I think, uh, pointed out was over a Reynolds number range of about uh, three decades almost, um, it is approximately 1.2. And uh, of course, you should also know that these uh, um, blue squares were my own experiments that was done low Reynolds number, but had the same exponent. The point is, this is exactly what Softman had predicted. And uh, in fact, um, not only was the decay law the same as Softman's prediction, but also uh, other things like the growth of the length scale, et cetera, I came out to be the same as what Softman had. So I sort of tend to think that it's uh, entirely likely that uh, the physics that goes with the decay of turbulence behind the grid is pretty much contained in the theory that Safman made. So I would say that's one of the important results to come out of this. Another, um, this is taken from this paper, another interesting experiment with which I had something to do, uh, therefore ICTP and this program had something to do, is that in uh, Predapio, um, near uh, Bologna, there's a huge pipe that has been built. And, uh, and this is the same tunnel where uh, Mussolini had his, uh, uh, has the idea of making aircraft uh, to, um, to prevent bombing from the Allies. Of course, he didn't build more than two aircraft, actually. Uh, but anyhow, that was in disrepair for a very long time. And uh, using that space, we built a, uh, I, I didn't have much to do with it afterwards, uh, uh, Alessandro Talamelli built a very beautiful and long pipe, 110 uh, meters in length, as you can imagine. It's a long thing, at almost a meter in diameter. And the reason for building that was you can go to very high Reynolds numbers, as in fact was done in the super pipe that uh, Lex Smith had. Um, which was small in diameter, about uh, 0.13 uh, meters. The, when you go to very high Reynolds numbers, the scales of turbulence, which scale in some proportion to the big diameter, uh, will become so small that you cannot actually measure them. So in fact, the idea was that unless you really invented new techniques for measuring small scales, which I will talk about a little bit later on, you had to really build some big experiment. And this has been built, but not, not really, uh, nothing very uh, important has come out of it yet. Um, I shouldn't uh, be careful when I say that. Um, so we'll see. We'll see there is a lot of promise in this, uh, this facility. Um, likewise, in, uh, in superfluids, there is this beautiful um, facility that was built by uh, Philip Roche in Grenoble, and it's called a Shrek, and it can, it's like the French washing machine that uh, you have all probably heard about. So two disks uh, which rotate in opposite directions, creating a turbulent flow. 
and uh, it can go to Reynolds numbers of the order of uh, 10 million, which I think will be remarkable. You can use uh, either a liquid helium or superfluid. Now, I think there is a big uh, expectation on what might be possible. Uh, those of you who, who remember Patrick Tabling, he had one facility like that, but it was smaller, lower Reynolds number, and things like that. And uh, another facility is this convection facility. Again, built in Göttingen, and uh, this now goes to um, Rayleigh really numbers of 10 power 15. It can be pressurized up to 19 um, atmospheres, uses sulfur hexafluoride for the working fluid. I must also point out, however, uh, we had a facility here um, which went up to Rayleigh really numbers 10 power 17, and this has still some ways to go but was using helium, and it had uh, its own issues uh, which we had to deal with. So that's, I think, uh, produced a number of results. Not yet, in my opinion, very conclusive. And there is this uh, Taylor Kuwait apparatus, very beautiful. Um, in both uh, Twente and the University of Maryland, again goes up to Reynolds numbers of uh, that large. Um, and uh, you should compare with what Sweeney had uh, some years ago, almost there, but now it is much better instrumented and, and everything than before. Finally, um, almost finally, uh, I want to, without showing you an experimental facility, one of the problems in which a real progress has been made is rotating convection. Surprisingly, uh, it seems to me that the big picture about the uh, rotating convection seems to be clearer than it was before, and I produced a graph for you which, which plots the Nusselt number here and the Rayleigh number here, and if there were no buoyancy, that is uh, no, no rotation, whatever, uh, then it, the, it would follow uh, the, this line. And of course, we don't really know what that line is if you ask the experts in the asymptotic state. But um, for what uh, we are going to talk about, it doesn't seem to matter. And uh, in this re regime, when the rotation is uh, relatively large, the Nusselt number doesn't follow this. It will follow some, some power law like this. And then uh, afterwards, when the effectively the the Rayleigh number becomes larger, so the buoyancy is larger relative to rotation. It follows this, uh, this line. So I think this is a beautiful set of experiments which have happened over time with, uh, in all in the last decade or so. Finally, on the RT instability, Rayleigh Taylor, which is one of the very important problems of this community, uh, there are many issues about creating experiments and uh, experts here would know, and um, uh, others would have to just believe me. But I think uh, one of the ones with, about which I am very excited is the, uh, is the um, uh, apparatus built in the University of Arizona by uh, Jeff Jacobs. And what it has is a, is a tank here that sort of accelerates down, uh, which has say, two fluids there, different densities, miscible or immiscible. And then it just basically is controlled acceleration, and you can measure um, all the properties that you are interested in. So that's by way of uh, uh, experimental facilities. But one thing that I thought was very important, which in some way this, uh, this uh, conference was uh, instrumental, uh, although I am not sure whether Bruce would agree or not if he's here, um, the National Ignition Facility has sort of opened up participation to a large number of uh, others who are not exactly already in that, in, that, uh, in that community. I think it's a very important development. Uh, although still it's very hard to get data and things like that from them, it is still a very important step in how the collaboration has gone on. So, so much for uh, facilities, but what about measurement techniques? Um, and now, uh, there are always improvements taking place. And for example, uh, item one and two are improvements. Pressure measurements, which were very hard to make. Now, uh, Yuki Tsuji in Nagoya has a really reliable pressure measurement device. And in fact, um, uh, uh, simulations by people like 
uh, Toshi Goto and uh, P.K. Young have uh, been compared with the measurements and they all hang together and I think we know what the pressure spectrum is like. Again, uh, miniature uh, velocity probes, uh, for example, Lex Mitz, there are others too who have been doing this, and that seems to have worked very well. Uh, but you may remember, uh, not that long ago, there were very few Lagrangian measurements. Now, of course, there is a plethora of people who do Lagrangian measurements, and very beautiful ones. And there is good synergy between simulations and experiments on this score. I think that's a very important development. And furthermore, uh, if you are into superfluids, um, before this uh, 2007 began, um, my graduate student, uh, Greg Bewley, had developed a, a tool for, uh, for visualizing uh, superfluids, especially uh, superfluid vertices. But they were always intrusive because the particles were too big. Um, and this was developed even more uh, by um, Dan Lathrop. But now, Vago in the University of Florida is developing um, non-intrusive measurements. Well, they're not exactly non-intrusive, but more or less. Basically, you ionize certain atoms of helium and then uh, use the ions to track the fluid itself. And it seems to have worked pretty well in terms of the data it already has produced. Another thing that I find uh, myself interest, uh, interested in is that there are fantastic tools now on seismology. That is, you just observe something on the surface of the object like the sun, and then you infer what's happening uh, inside the sun, especially the convective region. So they're all new measurement techniques. There may be others that I have not listed because I'm ignorant, but by and large, uh, some development has occurred. But I must say that in relation to the development of the experimental facilities, the development in the measurement techniques has sort of lagged behind. It's always been an issue in the field, and uh, I think it has remained that way in the last 10 years as well. So let me skip that. So let me now talk about simulations. What's happened in simulations? As you know, um, uh, the sim ability to simulate has just grown tremendously. As a function of time here, uh, the number of floating point operations you can perform is, is plotted here on uh, leadership machines, and you can draw a sort of line uh, like that through uh, the Reynolds number of the, uh, of the um, simulations, and then this is the kind of asymptote for the, um, the operations per second as a function of time. You see, not that long ago, I actually remember these times when we were only uh, here. Now it's many, many hours, so many people use um, tens of petaflops now without any, any problem. But now what's come out of all this? Um, I must uh, say these are the people with whom I collaborated, but there were a number of others in this audience who have done similar simulations. So what's happened? Obviously, the larger capacity to compute uh, has led to larger and larger sizes of computations. For example, P.K. Young computed a box which is 16,384 on the, on the side. And uh, remember that Steve Arshog, not that long ago, computed 32 cube calculations, and that excited the whole community at the time. Now, I think we have gone way beyond that, and uh, many things are possible. Now, this also means that there's a proliferation of computations. Now, everybody and his brother doing uh, experiments is so com considering is harder. Um, would want to do simulations. And uh, as we do more simulations, more problems have come into the fore. And one of them is the resolution. People always thought that direct numerical simulations meant that you uh, compute the Kolmogorov scale and everything above. But actually, it turns out as you go higher and higher in Reynolds number, smaller scales than Kolmogorov scale come into being and become important for many things. And uh, therefore, your ability to really go to resolve bigger and bigger boxes using the same resolution as before just somehow gets, uh, gets uh, uh, diminished somewhat. And that's one. And the other is, higher the Reynolds number, you have got to somewhat go longer in terms of time in order to get the asymptotic state, so to speak. People were used to doing 
uh, two integral length scales or three integral length scales and saying, well, we have reached the final state. But that's actually not true. It becomes harder and harder as the Reynolds number goes up. And then forcing methods. We still are not sure uh, whether the forcing, the way you force large scales, has any influence on the inertial and, uh, and dissipative scales. Actually, that's an important question. Uh, at some level, it doesn't. But at some level, it does. The deeper you go, more important these problems become. And then this configuration of boxes, periodic boxes, is certainly not the right one for rotating and stratified flows. And also, our real problem is there is so much competition for the computer time and leadership machines. If you're doing materials, or bioinformatics, or fintech, or, uh, or some other problems, it's easier to tell them that it's very important to give time. But if you say, well, I'm going to do turbulent mixing, it's a bit harder. And so you have to be inventive in how you actually uh, sell yourselves. So that's in terms of simulations. But let me say now, um, what new results? What new results? Um, and I'm going to say a little bit, uh, which I'm not going to cover. There has been enormous um, Im um, improvement in the, in, in the fluid particle interactions. And uh, there are many people are involved in this. I've listed a few of the people. And uh, they have made especially important progress in terms of computing clouds which Goto talked a little bit about yesterday. Um, and uh, so we, uh, interaction of turbulence with microparticles, even without considering the internal structure of these bubbles, it still has been a very important development. Um, let's, however, not forget that we sti still don't know for certainty that Richard's law, Richardson's law of diffusion actually works. I mean, there are many people who have tried to simulate it, but either the scaling range is not large enough, or in measurements, again, the same story. So there are basic issues like that still remaining, even though I would say a tremendous progress has occurred in terms of ability, in terms of capability. But finally, you have to ask, well, has this problem been solved? And I think we have still some ways to go in matters like particle turbulence interaction. And also, if you talk to uh, people like Cambon, uh, he will tell you that uh, there has been enormous improvement in the ADQNM closures, ability to study fluctuation, fluctuation interactions. Um, uh, these are the things I will not cover. Um, and so with apologies to people I have already mentioned here. And then considerable progress has taken place in predicting RT flows um, and uh, RM flows and, uh, and uh, validating numerical results. And uh, these people, um, let's say I just list them as a representative of a group. And various models have been developed for stratified um, effects and compressibility effects, uh, ablative RT flows, et cetera. Though that's a very important practical development. And also, uh, there is a lot of work that has gone on uh, in controlling RT instability, which uh, in, uh, in NIF, for instance, but I will not talk about that either. Likewise, I will not talk about uh, the theory of quantum turbulence, which Ithamar touched on, um, thermal convection, both experiment and simulation, magnetoconvection, turbulent boundary layers, which, which uh, Joe Klivicke talked about this morning, um, rotating flows, turbulence modeling, large-scale motions in the atmosphere like Madden-Julian oscillation, very important development. But all of that I will skip. Uh, but I will only talk about a few sample ones, mostly motivated by personal prejudice. One of them is the dissipative anomaly. And here, I think a really important development has taken place, in my opinion. And this has to do with uh, the impressive work on Ansager's conjecture. Let me explain what it is about. Um, Navier-Stokes equation tells you that the energy dissipation has terms like this viscosity multiplied by the square of the velocity gradients. So you would think by uh, something like that, that as viscosity goes to zero, the dissipation goes to zero. But that's not so in turbulence. 
Now, um, that's a hypothesized by Taylor in 1935. If you read his paper, you don't know where he got it from. In the previous sentence, there's no indication that the next sentence is coming. And once the statement is made, the next sentence doesn't have any connection with, with that statement. So, but he obviously knew what he was talking about. Now, he said that uh, the dissipation normalized by some length scale divided by velocity cube is just to make it normalized. It's of order one in a turbulent flow. Instead of going to zero, it goes to a constant of order unity. And this is called the anomaly. Anomaly because the symmetry that was violated by this parameter uh, new here, even when that goes to zero, the symmetry that is a conservation of energy is not restored. So that's the anomaly. And um, so one way to do that is to say when nu goes to zero, this, uh, this d, the limiting value of d, which I call d star, is of order unity, which is what restating Taylor. So this is the experimental thing that um, I made up uh, many years ago now. And it says that as Reynolds number goes to higher and higher values, that is viscosity goes to zero um, this, in this uh, axis, the dissipation rate that was all over the place comes to be a constant. And since then, of course, many uh, beautiful other experiments have been made, and many simulations. Uh, Canada uh, in uh, Japan made these wonderful simulations, which actually showed us many things. And then later on, others have carried on even further. So that's the dissipative anomaly. One doesn't exactly know how it happens that as viscosity goes to zero, well, why should the dissipation remain uh, constant? Uh, of course, you might say, well, there are boundary layer-like layer uh, structures, and then the singular, singular perturbation problem, all this stuff, but it really doesn't tell you what's happening. What Ansager conjectured was that, well, it's really got to do with uh, the, um, the um, let's say, the development of some kind of singularity in the Euler equations. And uh, I will uh, describe that. And the development here is that, uh, in fact, uh, that conjecture has been proved. So let's see what that means. Um, Ansaga's conjecture, uh, which he wrote up in the Italian journal Il Nuovo Cimento, and it has two statements. One of them is that for weak turbulence, of course, this is not exactly Navier-Stokes turbulence, weak turbulence. Um, that is, it satisfies the, um, I, I'll tell you a little bit on that later. Weak turbulence, um, weak solutions of Euler, if they have this holder type behavior for velocity differences, that is the difference in velocity between two points at the same time, go like some power to the uh, difference in space, then depending on the value of this theta here, different things happen. If theta is less than a third, Energy is conserved. There's no singularity, is nothing. Everything is perfectly smooth. And this statement has been proved, well, to some degree, Ansager himself had proved it, by others like Ayeng, Robert Duchamp, Constantine, T.T., A., uh, all of whom are familiar to this uh, community. The, uh, there's a second, so that's proved now. Um, there is the second part of the statement that if theta is greater than a third, then dissipation is possible. Dissipation is possible in Euler equations now. And uh, how it comes about, uh, you, it's uh, some kind of singularity, as I said, and it, there's a detailed mathematical structure to this, and this is all uh, proved by these people. And um, um, so, but what still remains to be done, which is the important part, is that, um, but do they have anything to do with the Navier-Stokes solutions with finite dissipation as nu goes to zero? I mean, the problem we talked about and the problem Ansager had in mind, which has been proved now, uh, still there is a disconnect between the two of them. So we still haven't gotten to answering the entire question, but part of the question seems to be answered. So I would say no to that. And what also remains is that uh, if you take a line cut of turbulent dissipation, it has huge fluctuations like that. And there is no indication at all as to whether such things actually happen through the Ansager mechanism. So that's one uh, very important development, in my opinion, a very basic thing. So let's go to the um, next one, which has to do with 2D turbulence. 
compared to 10 years ago, now I think we pretty much understand, it seems to me, what's going on. And uh, the important contributions came from Bob Craignan and George Batchelor. Uh, most progress has been made through numerical simulations because it's very hard to do real 2D uh, turbulence experiments. And uh, a review can be found here. Basically, if you take the whole range of spectral um, excitations in the flow and you, you excite at some uh, wave number, there are two types of cascades that take place in 2D turbulence. One of them is the so-called direct cascade of entropy, that is entropy, the square of vorticity, sort of goes down uh, to smaller and smaller scales. Whereas you have the inverse cascade of energy, that is energy goes from small scales to larger scales, uh, becoming larger and larger. Now what do we know about this? Taking the first direct cascade of entropy, this was the theory, theoretical result. And uh, um, if you take this correlation, uh, it is proportional to R through this flux of entropy. And the power spectrum has this, uh, um, this uh, roll off uh, with some corrections that Pregnant predicted. And it's an intermittent phenomena, higher order moments depart from Kolmogorov. And here, the phenomenological level progress has taken place. And it's not exactly conclusive the way you want it. So that's my assessment of where we are. On the other hand, if you go to the second problem, which is the inverse cascade of energy, where the prediction is that you have a five-thirds uh, spectrum and that uh, the velocity uh, uh, difference cube is proportional to R through this uh, energy dissipation rate, which is three halves coming there. And uh, furthermore, higher order moments will go like p to the power 3. Um, and this, remember, is violated in the uh, traditional 3D, spe 3D spectrum. That is, no, this, if this is true, then there is no intermittency in that region. And in fact, velocities, uh, in velocity differences are closely Gaussian with very small skewness, about non-zero skewness, because it has to satisfy this. But by and large, I think we sort of understand that this is a non-intermittent process. And uh, you can um, predict these things and actually find them in simulations. I think you might say that at least uh, one part of the problem seems to be pretty much understood. Another one which I want to say a little bit about, uh, because I've, I've been involved in this, uh, Sasha Migdal some years ago said, well, velocity differences are not the right quantities to look at, but instead circulation around a loop. Uh, you can take a loop like this or a loop like that or any other shape as long as the area that the loop uh, subsumes is the same. And then, uh, for example, for things like this, uh, this is all somehow mixed up. I don't know why. But anyhow, um, if you take R as the square root of A times B for a rectangle like that, then you calculate the circulation around this contour and take the peak moment of the circulation um, around a contour whose size is r, which is the uh, geometric mean of the two uh, dimensions. It has these exponents. And these exponents, he said, might have more interesting uh, properties. We had already tried to see about them um, a very long time ago when the simulations were still not as, were as anywhere as much as they are today. So now we have big simulations, and you can do this, and you can sort of ask yourself what's happening. So using 8,192 uh, two-cube simulations, what we found is that if you compute these uh, exponents, these exponents approach the Kolmogorov value with increasing Reynolds number. Furthermore, they're linear. That is to say, you are all used to this notion that if you plot uh, here the art of the moment and take any, uh, say, zeta p for the velocities, this is the Kolmogorov, and we have these, um, this nonlinear relation like that departing from Kolmogorov. But what we find is that um, they're linear here, um, like that, and if you do it at a lower Reynolds number, it is like that. 
But if you do higher and higher in our number, that's how it goes. I don't know whether it will ever go to uh, the Kolmogorov value or not. But you can see the result of this in the next slide. And uh, what you find is that, for example, as the R of the out of the moment here and the relative difference from the K41, that is this difference, divided with the Kolmogorov value, whereas for velocity differences you might see this kind of nonlinear and substantial numbers for the circulation at 8,192 cube simulations, it's like that. And um, so this linearity in itself, whether or not it actually approaches Kolmogorov value or not is, is already uh, very important. If it is linear, it means it's like a monofractal in some way. And of course, in particular, if it goes to K41, it's sort of basically the um, uh, most important thing we have always been looking for for a while. So anyhow, I don't know whether this is a settled issue or not at the moment, but that's uh, how the situation is. Next thing I want to talk about is passive scalar mixing, in which uh, tremendous progress has been made. I borrowed this from Goto. Basically, this is the wave number here, and this is the energy spectral density. If the frontal number is unity, then it has the spectrum, which is exactly the velocity spectrum. You have the inertial range with a five-third uh, slope, and uh, you have something here which is not exactly known. And if the uh, frontal number is very large, then what happens is the diffusivity gets uh, moved, uh, postponed to higher and higher wave numbers. So you have another power law here, which has minus one power, and uh, then some uh, behavior here. If, on the other hand, the diffusivity is large, then it already acts on, uh, on fluctuations before viscosity becomes important. So you have this region, which is a minus 17 thirds, and then another, another region there. So it's all uh, very interesting. It has been around for a while, but only in the last few years have things been uh, clear now. For frontal number of order unity, certainly there is a roll off at five thirds or thereabouts. And in fact, uh, velocity, even though the velocity may itself be somewhat non universal, it already is the case that the uh, passive scalar becomes. Uh, it assumes this form. But the obukov carson cons that is the, uh, not the exponent, but the coefficient sitting in front, it somehow still is not clear whether it actually is a universal or has uh, some dependence on forcing and shear. And likewise, uh, if you ask for higher order exponents, uh, even now I think it's pretty clear that velocity differences actually have this uh, departure from uh, Kolmograph 41 and uh, all that, but it's not clear what the status is on the universality or otherwise of the, for the scalar. And the scalar dissipation range does not appear to scale on uh, classical Kolmograph Ubukov scales. For large frontal numbers, what do we know? We know that minus one power law, which in fact was disputed only 10 years ago, it now is clear that it does appear. And the asymptotic behavior um, um, the value of frontal number, need, well, that's a minor point. The bachelor constant, or the constant sitting in front, is again not universal because it depends on forcing and mean shear, perhaps Reynolds number, and the scalar gradient skewness, which was a big, a big issue for a while because it's supposed to be zero if it is locally isotropic, but it is always constant of our unity, and now it approaches zero when the frontal number goes to infinity are very large values, but there is no theory for that. And uh, by some measure that in this region there is no intermittency. On the other hand, just as Goto said yesterday, uh, there is a agreement of the viscous diffusive region with Craigman's result rather than Bachelor's result, but it also has very interesting consequence. And the consequence is that um, that uh, because the Creighton uh, philosophy is rapidly oscillating fluctuations, it may in fact say that that will be, um, that might be uh, non-universal. Uh, so low frontal number, again, there are many interesting results. Um, and uh, low frontal number convection, a lot of interesting results. One of the important things is the frontal number goes to very low values, 
then there are structures which remain for a very long time, and so you have to average over a much longer period of time than necessary. So that's than you would think is possible. I'll be done in a few minutes, so uh, you don't have to stand, is what I'm saying. Uh, the RT mixing, very interesting things. Uh, for example, do we know the law for mixing zone growth? Uh, is it always like the square of uh, time? Actually, it appears to be the case only when you don't have uh, boundaries, you uh, don't have stratification, you don't have uh, many other uh, complications. So it's really not as universal as one might imagine. And then, given the unsteady character of RT flows, is the turbulence that develops there really standard turbulence, or is it somewhat different? And Snezan and I took a crack at uh, proposing an alternative, which I will not go into. But basically, it's a question that one has to sort oneself out for. And then there is the uh, compressibility effects, which can never be ignored in, uh, uh, in uh, practical RT flows. And there are many studies now on uh, compressible effects of compressibility on turbulence. For example, uh, here, as a function of Mach number, where compressibility goes up, you have the dilatational pressure as a fraction of the usual pressure, and you can see that the dilatation effect just takes off. And therefore, in fact, pressure has a very different connotation in highly compressible flows. Um, and what is interesting also is the, how the probability density of pressure changes as a function of Mach number. In fact, this is an interesting result nobody has explained. If you take the pressure spectrum in, uh, in, in incompressible turbulence, on the right-hand side, it is almost like a Gaussian. On the left-hand side, it is almost an exponential. And there is no explanation for this at all. But if you increase the Mach number, that is, compressibility goes up, this side, too, approaches a Gaussian, so it is essentially um, symmetric. And that is something that nobody knows an answer for. So now, let me, this is my last slide. So, so I should now say, how have we met these specific goals that I talked about in terms of the program, in terms of the communal development, etc.? cetera? Um, so first, um, embrace mixing in all its richness and organize meetings at regular intervals, raise money for them. I would give a check mark against it. I think it's done pretty well. So it, uh, you know, I think, has done well. The second one, act as a vehicle for scientific progress. That is, qualitative understanding for its own sake is something we ought to emphasize. And I, the problems I just mentioned are really a result of some of this outlook. And I would give a check mark against that as well. And uh, develop uh, predictive capability. Some of the authors I just casually cited there have done wonderful work in terms of simulate, in terms of being able to predict. I would give a check mark against that as well and publish major results in some collected fashion. I told you already how many publications, etc. Very respectable journals. That's also fine. Synergy between experiments, simulations, and theories, between applications and basic work, I would give a question mark. I don't know that this community, as we had intended, has really worked hard to enhance this collaboration or not. Um, well, we try. Everybody tries to say, well, it has to work together and synergy, all that stuff, but not much uh, that I know has happened. And build expertise on mixing in educational and outreach programs. Uh, this conference arranges some, um, some uh, tut tutorials and things like that, so I would uh, generously ch give a check mark to that. Notice that the thickness of the check mark here is um, not the same as that. Um, anyhow, Organize mechanisms to share research tools, methodologies, data analysis, and visualization. We basically haven't done anything. Um, we haven't done anything because we don't have an organization behind this thing. It's done by shoestring operation. You know, Snezana working very hard and uh, trying to raise money a little bit here and there. Me occasionally interfering with that. Um, basically. Uh, it requires a group of people, and there's really no group at all that is devoted to this big problem, and it has to have a numerical strength to it, not just one person can do all of it. And certainly, uh, this ambition to prepare a white paper for launching 
a decade study of non-equilibrium turbulent processes simply hasn't happened at all, again, for the reason uh, we have men I just mentioned. So if you want to really make progress on this, it's really not done by one person. It is done by a collection of people uh, devoted to this. And, uh, you know, it takes uh, a village to make something like this happen. And this, uh, this program has given a lot of impetus to uh, many things, but still it has uh, many more things which could accomplish and which it had thought would be possible to accomplish, but hasn't, has fallen short of. So that's my assessment of where we are in the last 10 years or so. I want to appreciate uh, the work that all of us here have done, Snezana in particular, I don't know where she is uh, in this collection. And uh, also the support that ICTP uh, has given. Thank you very much for that. Um, and of course, again, uh, thank you for your patience in listening to me. Thank you.